Hello there, welcome to the comments, the collaborative project by Espresso Global and Ukrainian Media. I am Elena Solodovnikova, and it's great pleasure for me to be joined by a writer and fellow at the Jamiston Foundation in Washington, D.C., Janusz Bugajski. Hello, Janusz. Hello, Elena. Good to see you. To see you too. Janusz, you are looking into different options of the collapse of Russia in the independent countries. Uh, to what extent do these processes depend not only on the countries occupied by Russia, but also on the West, which seems to be afraid of such a process? I think that the West is afraid of too many things. It's afraid of, of Russia winning and it's afraid of Russia losing. Um, at some point, it's got to stand up to, to principles, uh, principles of a free world, of independent states, of the end of the last empire in Europe and Eurasia. Uh, which is Russia, um, and, and the West can do an, a, a lot of things to help uh, defeat, not only defeat Russia, but to make sure that Russia never rises again to threaten neighbors such as Ukraine. And the first order of business is to give Ukraine the weapons that, that it needs. Uh, this should have been done early on. A lot of us here in Washington blame the Biden administration for being much too slow in providing the sort of military assistance uh, that Ukraine needed from day one of the attack or even before the attack in preparation for it or to deter it. Now it needs desperately artillery, it needs ammunition, it needs um, air defense systems, uh, also long-range weapons to destroy uh, Russian infrastructure and logistical networks. There's a lot that can be done. More and more is beginning to come in. And ultimately, I would say I am an optimist. I think uh, there's an old saying that uh, America tries everything else before it does the right thing. And I think eventually America will do the right thing. I expect, uh, again, I don't know for sure, but by the end of April, I think a lot of this funding should be released. So to answer your question very briefly, the West can do a lot to, to help defeat the Russian army in Ukraine. And that, I think, will help precipitate the beginning of the collapse of the Russian Empire, of uh, the, the so-called Russian Federation. But uh, what are the um, one or three fears of the West? Um, are they based on the new distribution of the oil and gas market or on so-called chaos in the world? This narrative is very popular, headlined by Russia. Yeah, well, the, the oil and gas market question has, has receded to the background because Europe uh, is no longer dependent on Russian energy supplies, with the exception of a couple of countries, uh, pro-Russian countries, uh, such as Hungary and Serbia, and possibly to some degree Austria. But Europe itself has weaned itself off the uh, Russian energy grip. Uh, it's no longer dependent on Russian energy. It's diversified. <clears throat> it's bringing new sources online. America isn't dependent on Russian source anyway. Um, and Russian sources will be depleted, um, whether by warfare, whether by infrastructure collapse or, or lack of investment. The big fear, I think, is, I would say, the nuclear weapons. In other words, that somehow... Uh, at some point, Moscow will fire nuclear weapons at the West because it's collapsing, which I think is an absurd uh, suggestion, quite frankly, because, you know, we, we can't claim that these people are, are kleptocrats and simply want money and at the same time claim that they'll commit nuclear suicide. They're going to want to save as much as possible of their assets, uh, maybe even in the new states that emerge from the Russian empire, they will seek positions. Remember what happened to the Communist Party secretaries that was uh, so loyal to Moscow, but quickly went over to the side of new nations, new regions that were emerging. So I don't expect, I think this nuclear question is overblown. And we know, of course, that Russia would be destroyed in any case within minutes if it tried to launch any attacks on the West. China doesn't want any kind of nuclear use, neither does any other nuclear power. Uh, so I don't see that the it, this threat is real. It's something that's used. It's it's dangled by Putin to frighten the West, uh, but I think it's it's uh, I don't it, it's extremely unlikely. Um, the other question uh, in terms of fear would be fear of unpredictability. In other words, fear, as you said, of chaos, of disruption, of uh, 
uh, which was the fear actually in the West when the Soviet Union collapsed, that there would be a lot of warfare between new new states emerging, that there would be um, a, lo a lot of uh, economic uh, uncertainty, that there would be refugee outflows and so on. Well, most of that didn't happen, and we settled down to uh, a relatively peaceful period. The problem was that Russia itself wasn't fully de-imperialized, just a part of it, the outer empire. So I think these fears are overblown. Uh, and I would listen to the countries next door to Russia. If they don't fear Russia, why on earth should America fear Russia? Absolutely. And, uh, well, uh, what do you think uh, will be the language of communication between the deoccupied countries? Probably that is a strange question, but uh, can the Russian language be used uh, or is it too toxic? Um, I would say in many places it's too toxic. In the interim, maybe the generation that still learned Russian will continue to use. I would prefer, I think everybody in the world should should be, it should be mandatory to speak English. Um, but uh, you know that includes all the states that emerge from Russia. Uh, but maybe I'm a bit prejudiced. Uh, but um, I would say what would happen as we see happening in places like uh, Kazakhstan, uh, other Central Asian countries, um, that even though they were very heavily dependent on Russian and Russified, uh, they moved away from Russian language because Russian language represented one pillar of Muscovite imperialism. Um, and uh, to restore your native language, to um, dis rediscover your, like Ukraine is doing, Re Ukraine is rediscovering its its literature, its arts, its history, its identity, which was so heavily Russified over the centuries. And now the Ukrainians are rediscovering that it's their own uh, history, it's their own identity. It's got nothing to do with Muscovy. It's got nothing to do with Russia. Uh, and I think all these countries neighboring Russia and the countries that are still occupied within Russia, whether Tatars or, or Bashkirs or, or, or Tuvans will rediscover their heritage, their traditions, their history and their language. I would like to ask you about the terrorist attack of the Krokus uh, City Hall in the Moscow, if you don't mind. Uh, what is your guess? It was organized by ISIS or by the FSB or by both? <laughs> it's, a, it's a question that at the moment is not fully answerable. All you can do is to look at the evidence so far. And the, ev the evidence so far in the history of Russian terrorism or the history of terrorism in Russia, I would say that at the moment it looks like a very botched job, a very poorly organized uh, uh, terrorist operation uh, by uh, the Russian interior security, in other words, probably the FSB, uh, trying to use Tajiks, um, Tajik citizens who were presumably recruited through some sort of ISIS network. And again, ISIS isn't a big tight organization. It's more of a network. And you tend to buy people to do certain things and then claim ISIS did it. My guess is this is, you know, my, my, my best supposition at this point with the evidence given that it was a poorly executed uh, FSB operation in order to try and discredit Ukraine, in order to raise public anger uh, against the West, in order to help in the process of mobilize, mobilization, because Russia's desperately going to need more troops as it loses so many tens of thousands on the front lines in Ukraine. So I think this was actually an attempt uh, very similar. Uh, if you remember in 1999 with the apart September 99 with the apartment buildings, three of them were actually blown up. In the fourth one, they caught some very suspicious guys laying, um, uh, laying bomb material. Uh, they claimed they were simply simulating a terrorist attack uh, but it seemed as though again it was partly botched it seems it, it, it's so amateurish uh, i think a lot of the senior guys in the kgb are going to look at this and say good grief our country must be in terrible state we can't even organize a terrorist attack anymore <laughs> properly so it's um you know it's an indicative actually also i would say of the the inability of the putin regime to protect its population or it's if i would go even further i would say the willingness of the putin regime to kill its population in order to achieve certain goals yes but uh uh, do they want to change focus of the world from the Ukraine to the these terroristic attacks and thinking about that, not about Ukraine? Well, absolutely. Look, there's a terrorist attack on Ukraine every day. 
every yeah. day Russia engages in terrorism against Ukraine. It's not condemned in the United Nations. I don't see a lot of the world leaders are going to, to President Zelensky and, and giving their condolences for all the deaths of children and, and women and old people and civilians, innocent civilians in Ukraine every day. Uh, Russia tries to distract. They're the victim. Throughout history, they've tried to depict themselves as the victim of outside forces. And this is a typical example of engineering a victim scenario. Yes, and the communication. But uh, we uh, do understand that Putin benefits from keeping the people in the fear and painting the new external threats in Russia. But why do Russia media exactly emphasize that this attack had been carried out by Tajik citizens, whom they have always considered as a second class citizen and mocking of them entirely? You know that. What was wrong with them? Why they use uh, well Tajik people? Why do you use Tajiks? Uh, from what I gather, this uh, ISIS group, uh, ISIS K, or Kurdistan area, uh, Central Asia, Afghanistan, they recruit a lot of Tajiks, Kyrgyz, and people from some of the other former Soviet republics, as well as Afghanistan and, and Pakistan. Um, so maybe it was easier for them to, to actually get some, some Tajiks than others. I mean, it, it, what is they couldn't get any Ukrainians to do this, um, even though, you know, they could buy and, and, you know, they do buy people in Ukraine and elsewhere or people that composes Ukrainian. They couldn't even do that. Secondly, I would say um, it was a huge error on their part to um, try to recruit Tajiks because the fingers in Russia are also appointing ethnic uh, ethnic populations that are not Russian. In other words, people from Central Asia, there's been now increasing uh, xenophobia. I mean, there's huge xenophobia anyway in Russia, but increasingly targeted xenophobia against people from Central Asia and the Caucasus, as well as Russia's Far East. I mean, they can't physically di distinguish between them, except that they're non-Slavs. So um, this, I think, uh, will rebound negatively against Russia, because as soon as you start to spark um, ethnic or religious religious animosities, uh, there's going to be a pushback from the other side. Even Kadyrov, the great uh, Putin loyalist, uh, if, you, if you know, soon after the attack said that uh, he would himself take measures against any uh, collect any re uh, collective responsibilities against Muslim population by Russian nationalists. So you see that the, the, the knives, in a way, are beginning to sharpen. And at some point, I think Moscow will do something that will provoke uh, in more in much more. We've seen it before, but much more intense violence between religious communities, in other words, Muslims and Christians, as well as between uh, Ruski and and non-Ruski, whether Bashkirs, whether Chechens. Uh, uh, um, Buryats or, or, or whoever it is that uh, is in line for scapegoating by the by the Russian media, by Russian nationalists. But previously they wanted to talk in another rhetoric that that all Russians and others. But first of all, I think about that so many Muslim people in Russia now and that uh, make uh, the uh, provocation against them. Why that we, it will be influenced what? on these people? Yeah, I think I think again it's an indication of a botched operation because they got Tajiks, but instead of people pointing the finger necessarily at Ukraine, they were pointing at Muslims. What happened? Do you remember soon after the bombing, they found this kid who was a Muslim who saved apparently a hundred or so yeah. Russian citizens or uh, take an order Why? from uh... Muslim, Why did they suddenly uh, find a Muslim that, that, that helps these people? Because they suddenly realized that they made a huge mistake and this could start precisely the sort of ethnic and religious conflicts that would more quickly bring Russia down to its knees. Yes, unfortunately, as a result, uh, they found some ways uh, to make in this context Ukrainians too. Gosh. <laughs> No, why? Well, for them, Ukraine and ultimately America is responsible for everything. I mean, Putin yeah. has said this is an existential war. If Ukraine wins, Russia is finished. Of course. Which I think is actually true, but not, not, not exactly in the way he means. But I think a military defeat in Ukraine, the loss of all the captured territories, will blow back, will boomerang back into Russia itself and will help precipitate the collapse of the Federation. Absolutely. 
I wanted to ask you about uh, your stance. Uh, what do you think about the activists of the Russian Volunteer Corps and their similar groups that want to liberate the land? I think they are a very important factor, not because of their size, not because of their impact at this point, but I think because of the symbolism. In other words, it shows the world that there, there are really three kinds of Russians. There are the imperialist Russians uh, who would support Putin uh, through war. There are the democratic imperialists amongst the Russian opposition uh, who claim that they, they want peace, they want uh, um, to live well with neighbors, but still want to continue the empire. And there's a third group who actually do want not only to overthrow the regime, but to reorganize the state so that Russia is no longer an empire. In other words, to de-imperialize the Russian state. I'm not saying everybody amongst these volunteers is such, but there have been there have been several voices. Remember, there's also a Siberian battalion, which consists not only of, of Ruski, but also of, of uh, Saka people, people from Buryats from other parts of Siberia, who also are fighting for an independent state. So I think this is a, a strong symbol that there are so to speak, good Russians. And this is very important for the world to know that there are those Russians in different regions as of current Russia, as well as non-Russians in different regions and republics who want this country finally de-imperialized, democratized, or at least if not fully democratized, to be able to live at peace with its neighbors and make progress, just as many of the post-Soviet republics did when the Soviet Union collapsed. And how ordinary people in Russia react to the appearance of these volunteer corps? And uh, Putin has even officially mentioned them. Uh, why he? Well, it shows. Made that, it? Yeah, it shows. It shows that their importance is right is rising. The idea, I think, um, and some of the leaders have said this: the idea is to capture and hold some of the territory in Belgorod, Kursk, and some of these regions, some of these oblasts bordering Ukraine hold territory to destroy the local uh, pro-Putin forces and to get some of these units to actually mutiny and go over to the side of the liberationist forces. You know, sometimes these processes are very slow, but remember revolutions are started by a few and if they can attract more and more uh, people from a country that's disillusioned with the way the war is going in Ukraine or disillusioned with the government that cannot protect them from terrorism or engages in terrorism they may well swing over to the new liberation forces this is I think partly the calculation uh, I think also uh, Putin does fear uh, that this would generate, that this would serve as an example to other forms of unrest in Russia itself. Remember, we had the Prigozhin mutiny last year, where a private military, so-called private, I mean, were funded by the state, uh, but but these little Putin Prigozhin thought he could overthrow um, the security uh, structure, not Putin himself, but the defense minister and, and, and Gerasimov, the chief of staff, he didn't manage to get all the way to Moscow because he didn't have a clear plan. But remember how easy it was for him to go right across central Russia with just a few hundred troops. Now you're going to have, I think, increasing numbers of armed uh, units coming into Russia from Ukraine, uh, from some of these free liberationist forces, including Chechens. So Russia itself, in many respects, <clears throat> is beginning to resemble a little bit um, uh, World War One. In other words, when Russia started losing at the front uh, against the Germans, uh, a lot of the troops uh, were coming back home disillusioned, angry, um, wanting to overthrow the Tsar, wanting to overthrow the the, reg the old regime. And this was ripe ground for for forces like the Bolsheviks and, and Mensheviks and social revolutionaries and others uh, to stir unrest and, and, and bloody unrest in different parts of the country. It also released, remember, 20 years of civil war, where Moscow took about 20 years to subjugate all the nations, including Ukrainians, that wanted to break away from, from the old Russian empire. So it's almost like a beginning of a new uh, implosion, a violent implosion, with all these military units uh, that are now beginning to enter Russia. And it, by the way, it wouldn't surprise me if others uh, happen as well. What do you mean? 
if other units begin to penetrate Russia, in other from words, Russia, other do, you, do you mean that uh, that units will uh, uh, start it from Russia, not from Ukraine? They will organize the, inside the could Russia. Could be from Ukraine, could be from other countries. In other words, units that are formed in either in Ukraine or neighboring countries that come in to liberate their territories, such as the Siberian battalion, such as the Chechens, uh, such as these Free Russia legions. Yes, for example, we have Belarus uh, units in Ukraine, Polka Lenovskava. And uh, what is your stance on the liberation of Belarus? Uh, what is need to topple to Lukashenko from the pre pre presidency? Yeah, I don't think Lukashenko will last very long once the, the, the Putin regime begins to crumble. And even before that, if there are major power struggles, which I suspect there will be uh, within Russia, I think uh, Lukashenko will also be part of that power struggle. Whether he will be replaced um, peacefully uh, through a palace coup of some kind, or whether there'll be some sort of mass mutiny uh, or peace, mass peaceful protest that will eventually overthrow him. I mean, there are different scenarios, but I don't think Lukashenko will last much beyond, um, you know, the beginning of the end of the Putin regime. And it could even be sooner. Uh, but why do you think so? Because uh, he is still president during the uh, 30 years. And well, he's president El during 30 years, but we saw in 2020 when there were peaceful demonstrations against him. There, there were literally hundreds of thousands of people on the streets in Minsk, even though large parts of the Belarusian population may consider themselves very close to Russians. They tend to live in the smaller towns and smaller rural areas, particularly in the east and southeast of the country, whereas much of the western part of the country and Minsk in particular, most people feel themselves as, as, as Belarusians as separate from Russians and would welcome a new leader that would help liberate them from a Russia that is dragging Belarus itself into, uh, into potential war and potential chaos. Let's put it this way. Lukashenko has resisted uh, complete Russian control. He hasn't been dragged into the war. He's helped Russia conduct the war, but he hasn't used any Belarusian troops. He now is threatening Poland and the Baltic states, which is a bit of a joke. I don't think anybody takes him seriously. But it indicates to me that his rule is not certain. He has to make postures, make gestures to put in every so often to show that he's loyal. There's one other possibility, which I wouldn't completely discount. At some point when Putin is, is, is clearly losing the war in Ukraine and there are major reversals, even the Russian front collapsing in, in the Donbass or Zaporizhia or uh, Kherson or even Crimea at this point, um, that Lukashenko will say, no, see, I'm, I'm the great nationalist. I want to restore an independent Belarusian state free of Russia. I wouldn't discount that possibility. But from, uh, from everything I hear, and I just returned from a long trip to Poland, uh, they, they don't think, and they have very good intelligence in terms of what's going on in Belarus, they don't think that he would last this, uh, that that would be a step too far, that there would be some sort of coup against him at that point, or even some sort of popular revolution. If uh, we imagine that uh, Lukashenko uh, will be toppled, and uh, will the Belarus be able to regain its independence? Because we know from history that the risk uh, about that uh, new uh, uh, Belarus can add to Poland or to Lithuania, to other uh, countries. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, there is a, a Belarusian national identity. It's it's not as strong, obviously, as the identity of Poles or or, or definitely not Ukrainians. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, sometimes in the time of crisis, uh, uh, national identities are accelerated. Um, you know, during uprisings, during revolutions, during major international crises, sometimes identities are born or rediscovered or reinforced. You know, this is what's happened throughout history. So I, I don't, uh, I don't uh, exclude also that that Belarusian identity will strengthen as a result of this war. I think a Ukrainian identity, quite for, a Ukrainian victory, uh, will strengthen Belarusian identity, um, and it will also strengthen the identity of other people peoples that are beholden or controlled um, or subsumed or dependent on Russia uh, within the, the, the current Russian empire. I hope uh, uh, that Belarus identity will be rising. 
Uh, these days, there are frequent warnings about the threat of occupation of the Baltic states. What uh, are the possible scenarios of this occupation? Well, the possible, yeah, the possible scenarios of uh, of Russia attacking and invading and holding territory in the Baltic states. If you look at the map, the Baltic. The states are very vulnerable. They're small countries. Uh, they don't have sufficient military. If there was to be a large-scale Russian attack, I'm looking at the pessimistic side. I'm actually an optimist on this. But looking at the pessimistic side, Russia could very quickly, if it used ground forces and, and air force, in other words, destroy the... There's not much of a local air force anyway, but to destroy a lot of the military infrastructure from the air and come in by land and take over the cities, you know, Tallinn and Riga in particular. Uh, Vilnius would be a bit more problematic because Poland is right next door, and I think any attack on Lithuania would automatically trigger a Polish response. We're not absolutely as clear uh, how quickly Poland could respond in case of an attack on Estonia uh, or on Latvia. And this is why the, the, there's something very important. Uh, there's a little geographical area called the Suwałki Corridor, which is between Belarus and uh, Krulewiec or Königsberg, formerly Kaliningrad, um, which is only about 120 uh, kilometers wide. And when NATO would have to buy land, reinforce logistically the Baltic states in case of an attack. So the danger is that the Baltic states could be relatively isolated for a few crucial days uh, before NATO, if, of course, NATO responds uh, fully as it should under Article 5, uh, comes to the assistance of any of the Baltic countries. So this is sort of the worst case scenario that somehow <clears throat> at some point the Russian army would revive itself and uh, and invade and take the three Baltic states. Again, that's the, op that's the pessimistic scenario. I'm more of an optimist. Uh, the Russian army took how long to take Avdiivka um, or Bakhmut? How many died? How much was destroyed? I don't think the Russian army at this point or, or in any near future is in any shape to stage a major land assault on any country, uh, including the Baltic states. They may try some provocations. They may try and stir trouble with the ethnic Russian minorities in these countries. But I don't see a major military assault, even though they, you know, some of their propagandists are threatening such a thing. Um, the Russians, if they manage, this is the bigger fear, I think, in the region, that the Russians, if there is, let's put it this way, if there is no massive assistance to Ukraine to, to win this war, if the lines somehow, either the, um, there is some deal in which Russia manages to keep some of its territory, if some of the sanctions um, begin to be lifted and Russia starts to rebuild its military, that maybe within two, three, four or longer years, uh, Russia will then be in a position, much stronger position to threaten its Western neighbors other than Ukraine. This is the sort of uh, scenario that a lot of people paint in places like Warsaw and Vilnius and, and Tallinn. And this is why, for instance, uh, Polish defense spending is now going like this. It's a, it's four percent and climbing, and Polish military is building up its forces, build its stockpiling, building a, a great weapons supply from the U.S., from uh, other West European countries, from South Korea, in preparation for war. And Prime Minister Tusk just a couple of days ago actually said we are in a pre-war situation, a pre-war era. In other words, the idea is to warn people just in case the Western alliance fails Ukraine and America fails Europe, then Poland has to be ready. And Poland has to be ready to defend itself and to defend its immediate neighbors. So I think those warnings are very important because they it convinces countries such as France and, and Britain and, and even Germany that a war is coming and they have to be start to, to wake up. They have to start getting prepared for a major confrontation with Russia in the next few years, with or without American involvement. With American involvement, I think any chances of Russian attacks or provocations against Europe uh, decline. They diminish. But uh, why now Poland uh, uh, does, uh, doesn't react to the Russian missiles in their territory? Well, what they say, I think they should actually, but what they say is at the moment 
uh, we need some sort of an agreement with Ukraine and they're beginning to work this out. At what point do we shoot this weapon? Because they can shoot it. There's no problem to shoot it. But where does the debris fall? Um, does it, Does it? you know, they killed a couple of Polish farmers, I remember, last year yeah. where the missile fell. Uh, what if they shoot it down over Ukrainian territory? It may fall and kill some of the, um, you know, some of the Ukrainian farmers. So one, one has to, I think there has to be better coordination between air defense forces in both countries. I think actually what should happen is a no-fly zone uh, placed over all the border regions, NATO border regions, and that would include uh, a large chunk of Western Ukraine, obviously, in which NATO would not only intercept planes, but would intercept all missiles. But there has to be full understanding agreement by allies and particularly by the countries affected, Warsaw and uh, and Kiev. I would have liked to have seen uh, Paul shoot it down. Um, I, I, I suspect that if this missile was heading a bit further into Poland, that it would have been shot down. But the traje tra trajectory was coming out of Poland at the same time. Remember, there was also an attack uh, in Romania. There was uh, indications that uh, a drone, uh, I think it was an Iranian drone, uh, one of the Sahid drones that the Russians fire at Ukraine actually misfired and landed and and blew up uh, on Romanian territory, which, remember, is also NATO territory. I, so I think that no-fly zone has to include the borders with Romania, which would include uh, Moldova, which would include uh, Bukovina, which would include um, uh, the, the Bessarabian region and the Danube region, in other words, Ukrainian regions along the coast. So, you know, a lot of work is to be done by NATO, NATO, and uh, I'm not excusing anybody. In fact, far from it. We blame NATO for not being better prepared for this. I wanted to ask you, what is the secret on Finland's success in relation with Russia? Why do Russia threaten Berlin, Paris, uh, but seem to have forgotten about the things after they had joined NATO? Yeah, well, it's, it's quite amusing how Russia uh, draws red lines and then retreats from those red lines. It just shows you that if, if, they, if they're pressed, uh, if you don't take them seriously, if you call their bluff, they retreat and then they've come up with some other red line. And the Finns, the Finns are not afraid of the Russians. They've had two major wars with them, remember, in the 20th century. Uh, Finns probably per person killed more Russians than anybody in, in history at that time during those Russian invasions. So the Finns are ready. The Finns know the enemy. Um, the Finns understand Russia, I think, probably as well as uh, the Poles and the Ukrainians because of uh, centuries of oppression and war. Um, and the, the Finns, despite their neutrality, actually kept uh, in very good shape their military, uh, their military stocks, their military training, um, the, the the military forces. So the Finns are very well prepared for any kind of Russian uh, assault on their territory. Maybe why the Russians don't really talk about entering Finland, whereas they think the Baltic states are uh, less prepared and more vulnerable. Um, I think the Finns had a, an enormously important dimension also uh, to NATO in the Baltic area and also the Arctic area. You know, to have the Finns and the Swedes now within NATO makes basically makes the Baltic Sea a NATO lake, in other words, a secure lake, other than Kaliningrad, which eventually, uh, or Konigsberg, which eventually will become, I think, an independent uh, republic. And then, of course, the St. Petersburg or Ingrin area, which, again, I think will be increasingly contested. Uh, one other thing about Finland, remember, there's parts of Russia, the Karelian region, or the Karelian, Karelia Republic, uh, where there are um, many ugro finnic speaking people, and I'm sure the Karelians would rather be a part of Finland, which is a very rich, prosperous European Union country, than they would to be a part of destitute Russia. Uh, yes, uh, absolutely agree. Uh, that is uh, probably provoke and uh, sticky topic why I ask you. Under what conditions should Ukraine claim the territory that historically belonged to them? such as Kuban and Belgorod, uh, there are many Ukrainians still live. Yeah, I think at some point, uh, as Russia as Russia ruptures, I think Ukraine will have uh, claims to those territories, but I would say to hold really democratic referenda to see whether the, the people in these territories, these new territories, want to belong to uh, an independent Ukraine that's moving towards NATO, moving towards European Union. 
Um, the conditions aren't there yet. That's why these regions first have to be liberated from the Muscovite forces. And then we see where the population belongs. Remember that there's also local identities in many of these regions that are not Muscovite. Um, you know, Russification has been going on for many generations. It includes many territories that we normally consider to be a part of Russia. Uh, in the Kuban, I think it may be a bit more complex because remember there are you know, uh, parts of Kuba, what's, what Ukraine's called Kuban, was Circassia. Uh, so there needs to be, I think, a, this is a good opportunity, I think, now even, for dialogue between Ukrainians and free Circassians, or Adig people, to talk about the future shape of, uh, the future border, let's say, between Ukraine and Circassia, exactly where it will be, uh, which, which territories will be included, and so forth. You know, maybe the time to start on this question, as well as trying to liberate these territories is now, at least some initial meetings to this to this effect. And this is why I think it's extremely important to recognize the genocide of the Circassian people by Muscovite forces, one of the major genocides uh, in the 19th century. And I think every country should recognize this. But yes, and, and also remember, uh, Elena, there are territories, the different wedges, the Kline, in different parts of uh, Russian, so-called Russian Federation, where Russian, where Ukrainians, uh, Ukrainian people were exiled to, uh, and they formed communities. In many places preserved their their history, their language, their identity, their religion. Well, if not religion, because they were very much Russified, but at least some kind of identity that they really need help to rediscover their Ukrainianness. And this is, you know, as far east as Irkutsk, uh, but also the far eastern, uh, the Khabarovsk regions of Vladivostok and so forth. You know, many Ukrainian people, that, as Ukraine wins this war, I think more and more people trapped within the Russian Federation will discover their Ukrainian heritage. And that should be encouraged, not only by Ukraine, but I think it's also the responsibility of major Ukrainian diasporas, including in Canada and the United States, to help those people to rediscover their Ukrainian heritage. There are many more, let's put it this way, Len, there are many more Ukrainians than the Russians lead people to believe. I wanted to ask you about uh, the Serbia and Kosovo conflict. Uh, and what do you think about that uh, last Vucic statement? They tried to talk about the uh, new um, uh, threat to his country and other else. What does it mean for, for Serbia and Kosovo? Well, I've been working uh, in the Balkans for something like 30 years now. Uh, I was there during the wars and I was there when uh, all the republics freed themselves from Belgrade, much like um, many uh, republics within now within Russia will free themselves from Moscow. Um, so when Yugoslavia was collapsing, including, of course, Kosovo, which gained its independence through NATO intervention because they didn't have a strong local army and they were very highly uh, penetrated and repressed by the Serbian minority, by the Serbian Milosevic regime. Now, Vucic, remember, was uh, uh, put, uh, was, <laughs> I mix up Putin and Milosevic sometimes, they're very similar, oh. but he was, uh, he was Milosevic's propaganda minister um, who, um, was very adamant that Kosovo would never be independent. So he's maintained this position, basically. You know, if you read anything or look at anything, listen to anything he says, Kosovo, there'll never be normalization because we will never recognize Kosovo as an independent state, uh, which, of course, is like saying that, you know, we, we we want your territory, but we don't want your people, which is exactly what Putin is saying to Ukraine. And it's exactly what Milosevic was saying to, to the Kosovars, even though you're the majority we don't want you. This is Serbian land, so so we will expel you or we'll kill you, and we'll just keep the land, which is exactly what Vucic really wants uh, in Kosovo. But he can't achieve that because NATO is there, because the US is involved, uh, because the European Union is involved. What he wants is for European Union and, and the United States to lose interest in this country. In other words, to, to take the remaining troops out. Remember, there are still American troops in Kosovo to take the remaining troops out, to take out the missions, um, and for the European Union basically to push Kosovo away. Well, this isn't happening because I think the majority of European Union states understand and recognize Kosovo as independent. In fact, only five don't. Um, 
European Union members. And uh, I think uh, the, the, it's gone too far that they'll ever gain Kosovo back. But it's a struggle now because Russia wants to use this territory, uh, the Balkans. Traditionally, it's, it's interfered and used it for its strategic purposes in the eastern Mediterranean, Balkan Peninsula, Central Europe. It, again, uh, it's trying to destabilize the Balkans through Vucic, who wants some sort of Serbian condominium, not only in Kosovo, but also Montenegro and Sarnagora and Bosnia-Herzegovina. Uh, and Putin is aiding and assisting him because he thinks this will disrupt, disrupt NATO, it will undermine Western unity, and it will distract attention from Ukraine. So it is a potentially dangerous time in the Balkans as well, not only because of Vucic, but because, of, because the, the Moscovites want to generate a new conflict against the West. Uh, in uh, what conditions uh, do they dare to start this conflict on, Bal on Balkans? Well, let's put it this way. At the moment, uh, it's going to be very difficult for them, uh, a pure military attack. But what they, what they are much, much more likely to do is to stir some sort of internal revolt. Remember, Russian intelligence agents, I'm not sure how intelligent they were, but working for the intelligence agencies, together with Serbian intelligence agencies, tried to stage a coup d'etat in Montenegro a few years ago in 2016 against uh, President uh, Djukanovic at the time and failed. Um, they tried to stir a revolt in Kosovo last September. They failed. But maybe they're learning from their mistakes and will try harder next time. It's almost like they're testing the ground. Uh, we'll wait to see exactly uh, what the next step will be in terms of their provocations. But in the meantime, NATO, I think, is realizing finally that this is an internal front that really has to be handled with more troops, um, more more expulsion of Russian agents, uh, more pressure on Belgrade to cut its ties with Russia, um, and more support for the independence of Kosovo, Montenegro, and Bosnia Herzegovina. Otherwise, Russia itself won't act militarily, but it can draw Serbia into a war with its neighbors by pushing Vucic, encouraging him, giving him you know, weapons, um, information, uh, agents, even some volunteers to fight against Albanians and, and Bosniaks. How do you imagine the new world order? Who will the main players in it? Well, I think before we have the new world order, we're going to have new world disorder. Um, I don't know how long that's going to last. It's going to be a little bit chaotic. Uh, but I think basically what it boils down to, it's a struggle between imperialism and independentism. You know, the states that are for the imperial model of international relations, where a few countries dominate uh, and have small countries revolving around them. <laughs> the Russians call it multipolarity. I wrote about it many years ago before it became popular. The idea, it's not multilateralism, where every state is equal and has a decision, but where there are big states and there are small states. The big states dominate, the small states basically agree with them, revolve around them, orbit them. This is the Russian imperial model. It's also the Chinese imperial model. And to some extent, I would say it's also the Iranian imperial model uh, in the Middle East. The, the alternative is the independence model. In other words, every nation, every state uh, should have the opportunity to be independent. And what do we mean by independence? That has, it has a voice in international institutions. It can jo join any international alliances that it wants to. It can make treaties with any country that it wants to. Um, and it, it can even exchange territories if it wants to um, in the future. That is the, the basis, the core of state independence. So the new world order, if Russia is defeated in Ukraine, I think it will help precipitate and uh, not only the collapse of Russia, but it will strengthen and reinforce those forces that are fighting for national independence, uh, not just uh, in, in Europe, but also in Asia vis-a-vis -vis China.